eBay Motors is here for the ride. Elbow grease and a whole lot of love transformed 100,000 miles and a body full of rust into a drive entirely its own. LED headlights, spoilers, whatever you need. eBay Motors has it at affordable prices. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride every time. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. Welcome to The Inevitable. This is Motor Trend's new podcast about the future of the automobile. I am Johnny Lieberman, the Senior Features Editor at Motor Trend, and I am joined every week by my co-host, Mr. Ed Lowe. That's me. I'm the Head of Editorial for Motor Trend, and boy, do we have an amazing list of guests that we're going to be chatting with. We've got the godfather of the environmental movement, Ed Bagley Jr. Derek Jenkins, a whole bunch of actors, celebrities, car-crazy folks, people from in and outside the industry. Industry. Can't wait for you to join us. We we're talking about the future of the car. This means everything from electrified vehicles to cars that drive themselves. Come check us out. We're on podcastone.com or anywhere else you find your favorite podcast. We're also on motortrend.com and youtube.com slash motortrend. Hey guys, this week on CarCast, we welcome back our good friend Alistair Weaver from Edmunds.com. We're going to get into that article about uh, the the trucks towing, including the Ford Lightning. What happened to the Ford Lightning during the tow? A little bit about the Z06, uh, a d- little debacle uh, he had with his Rivian, all kinds of stuff and more. Before we get started, here's Geico. Do you own? Do you rent your home? Sure you do. And it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling your policies with Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you have so much to do already around your home. Why not make it easy? Go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save. It's Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That's Geico.com. Welcome to CarCast. I'm Matt, the moderator, DeAndre, here with Bill Goldberg. Uh, Bill's uh, he's out of town. He's in a new location here. I know you guys can't see him on camera, but uh, uh, where are you, Miami? 94th birthday today of my mother. So, yes, all the kids flew down to Miami to uh, celebrate. And so, yes, I've got a, quite the pasty background here at the Ritz <laughs> So your brother is everybody's in town for mom's birthday, huh? Everybody's in town for mom's birthday, and uh, you know, my Dodge boys will not like me, and you guys are gonna love this. But uh, they had no challengers or chargers at Hertz in Fort Lauderdale, and so I am now currently driving a Shelby GT500. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool car, yeah. It's a cool car to drive around in Miami. How did uh, uh how did everything uh, how'd mom and everything survive with the um. Uh, with the hurricane out there i maybe wasn't quite that far yeah it, it, it did no damage really you know obviously the weather changed a little bit but i mean there's no direct impact down here in miami fort lauderdale area it was on the other coast so yeah um, she just stayed put she didn't she didn't leave town <laughs> she's just like no, she hunkered down plant my flag here hurricanes be damned she's like i'm 94 a hurricane's not gonna stop me now <laughs> exactly. no question. she's lived through a number of them already so, yeah I mean, what's uh, all right. Then uh, Alistair Weaver from Edmunds.com. Welcome back, Alistair. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, Fine. there was uh, kind of a, a lot going on since the last we spoke. Um, uh, I want to say Detroit Auto Show maybe had popped up between now and then. I don't know if we chatted oh, yeah. between Forgot- them. I'd forgotten. I'd forgotten we went to that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, Z06, uh, Corvette Z06, uh, you know, sort of ride and drive press event happened. Um, uh, there's quite a few things, but I want to, excuse me, I want to quickly start about this, um, this article you guys wrote. I say you guys, I don't know if you wrote it, but you were in the video. So this is, this is on you. Got nowhere to hide. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you did tow testing with the Ford Lightning versus some other trucks. And I I guess everyone was just asking the question well, first of all, people just categorize it very broadly and go, it can tow, it can't tow. And I was like, that that's not 
I don't know what that means. I think that's just like a Twitter thing, just to poke the bear, right? Like, it can't tow. Like, I don't know what you mean. Anything could tow. <laughs> like, like, what are you towing? Like, what are you talking about? So uh, everyone, I think, was kind of looking for an answer going, hey, uh, if it tows, what does it do to the range? Do you lose 30%, 40%, 50% of the range? And I read – did anyone chip in to ninety percent? Right. Did anybody guess like it would be ninety percent? I don't think anybody guessed ninety percent. So, as I was reading the article, um, I was you know figuring out. You're like you're saying, oh, you lose a certain amount of mileage, but if you take a gas engine or diesel truck, you lo- you lose some range on the fuel tank. The fuel economy drops, and you're doing the math on it. But at the end of the article, everyone's like, what's the answer? You didn't write the answer. You didn't write down what's the range, what would have been the range or is the range if you're towing. And people are like doing the math going, well, it's the 215-mile loop. And then he had to pull over with like 100 and something miles left. And then there's 60 miles on the loop, but 40 miles on the range. And they're like – so people are like, did we come up with 190 miles? And uh, so anyway, that's that's my beef with your article. You didn't answer the question. As okay. as simply um, as we what thought, is that? I'm leaving now. <laughs> um, it's uh, I, 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 blimey, um, not good. We know. No, I'm, I'm just uh, I'm uh, blah, blah. Uh, no. Basically, Matt, the long and short of it is that it's a nuanced answer, and nobody likes a nuanced answer, right? Everybody wants just to say it's 35. percent This is shit. Right? Everybody. You know what we do is we all skip to the end of the article to get the answer. And then if we like the yeah. answer, we go back and read the article. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't want to tell you. Did you, actually, did you actually watch the film or is it one of those things where like it's like a Twitter thing? Well, you know, it's the worst film ever, but I haven't actually seen it. Um, I, saw so, a lot, I saw a lot of clips of you on Twitter bitching about the lightning. <laughs> I thought you bitching more about the infrastructure. Than that, the that's what really what it was, is you were like trying to plug shit in. Shit wasn't working. And yeah, it was a lot of that. So let me get let me go back a step then. Give you, give you a go for that. The, the reality is like a bunch of people, including us, have done like preliminary tow test stuff with the lightning and got pretty mediocre results with it. People were saying like the range just suddenly comes down to like 100 miles. So we wanted to like do a proper story where we got together a gas, a diesel, a hybrid, and the lightning. And that's what we did. And we defined a route around Southern California that included quite a lot of gradient, went up and down the grapevine, went across Mojave. It was, it was as hot as hell. And it took a lot of work to put all this together and get the four trucks together. And what we decided to do was for, was tow four Teslas. So we had four Model 3s on identical trailers, and we even went to the extent of weighing the Model 3s and equalizing all the mass because the Teslas differ a little bit depending on which model year it is. So we basically had four identical loads towing it across uh, Southern California. Now, the Lightning performed a lot better than we expected. We were getting, realistically, in those conditions, about 170, 180 miles of range. Which was better than we that better than we thought. So we went and actually got hold of Ford's. We have a bit of relationship with Ford and talked to their uh, engineers. So we got the engineering chief on the phone from the Lightning and said, "You know, we just want to understand why this is doing better than everybody else seems to be doing." And the reality, the, their, their explanation was twofold. One was, if you put a car on a trailer on the back, obviously there's aerodynamic benefits compared to like a U-Haul box or something like that, which mm. is much more slab-sided. So that, that obviously makes sense. Okay. But they reckon the other big part of it was we were doing – we made some rules that basically said, right, we, we went down to like the air con must be on 72 degrees. You must drive this speed. And we said that the speed limit, as you know, in California for towing is 55 miles an hour. So he said, okay, we're going to tow at the speed limit, and we're going to normalize it. And Ford's engineers basically said – and this correlates with our own knowledge as well – is that – the slower they go, you the slower the slower you go, the further you go. Yeah. So the fact that we did our test at fifty five and other people have done it at sixty five or even seventy five whilst towing, which is super quick, has just made a dramatic difference. So the learning is basically that if you tow at fifty five miles an hour and don't just tow a blunt instrument, 
then you're probably going to get 170, 180, even up to 200 miles out of your truck. If you stick a blunt U-Haul on the back and to, uh, uh, and um, and drive really fast, you're not. The other thing that I think that was really, there's a couple of other things that really came out of it that, that I thought were interesting. The regenerative braking impact is actually bigger with a trailer on the back because if you go down a gradient, they say, well, you went up the gradient, but you also went down it. And they wouldn't give me a percentage for how much you recoup, but it's actually quite high because you've got the trailer pushing the truck down the hill. So you actually get more regenerative braking effect than you would if it was just the truck. Because basically, if you think about it, the electric motor is, is, is working like engine braking to counter this. And we were what were we towing? We were towing like 7,000 pounds. It yeah, wasn't a lot. It was like 67 or 6,800. 67, like, 68, yeah. yeah. So basically, you've got 6,800 pounds pushing this thing down the hill. And so you get more regen. So the reality was because we went up the grapevine and it went, the range went down, then we went down it and the, you know, and suddenly everything equalized a bit. So the reason it's a slightly nuanced answer is it kind of depends how fast you're going and what you what you're pulling. And the actual weight is less important than the aero and particularly the speed. So it was really, it was really interesting. And then the other part of it was actually on a cost, if you fast charging, if you're using fast chargers. It's not actually much cheaper than diesel. It's a little bit cheaper, but it's not much cheaper than diesel. Um, and you know, w- and then we can talk more. But we got into loads of infrastructure problems, which I think is the real issue. Right. That's that's where where the the article ended up getting. You know, it it had sort of this this caveat to it going well when it came down to taking it and 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 charging it. That's where you guys ran into issues, like you had to unhook the trailer to get it into a charger, and then one of the chargers wasn't working. And and you're right, that's almost a different uh, discussion. So uh, I get the thing about the range. So my Lightning, um, we talked about a while ago, I drove it down to Oceanside. We visited the guys at HRE Wheels. Supposed to have 300-mile range. And... When I got out on on kind of the open road, once you leave LA, it's it's pretty easy to get out. And I just set the uh, the cruise control. I wanted to fuss around with the with the blue cruise thing to see if it would stay in its lane and and activate. It all worked, and it all worked fine. But I was just like, eh, let's set it at eighty five, you know, and and no one's on the road. Let's see what happens. And and yeah, with without any real braking, right? Because I'm just kind of out on the open road. Um, and the aerodynamics of that truck or, or lack of, and at that speed, I, I didn't get 300 miles of range. It got more like 275, 276, something 274, somewhere in that, in that, in that range. I would imagine if I set the cruise control at, you know, 62 or something or 65, maybe I would have gotten a little much closer to that 300 mile range. But I, you know, I, I drive the truck. Like a sports car, <laughs> and not some. I don't think you're supposed to. It's pretty big for that, but uh, but it's quiet. It's got the good acceleration, so it's it's fun to get on it. And you know, I've only charged it like I've charged it once, and and like topped it off a couple places here and there when I when I got like a free charging thing at like the mall in Santa Monica. So I haven't done much charging on it, and and the. You know the truck is figuring out the way I drive. It's like 280 mile range. You know, maybe if I drive it more normally, uh, that's going to change. So, uh, you know, I, I think that that plays a big a big factor is how how fast you're going to go and how how aggressively you're going to drive the vehicle. Yeah, we run it through our range test without the trailer on it. And this was the platinum, platinum extended range. Platinum's got slightly less range than the Lariat because of the wheels and stuff. But it's supposed to have a 300 mile range. We actually did 332, uh, but that's driving sensibly. It's not sort of like you know jumping on the throttle and stuff. So you know, drive it normally. You're probably going to get 300 miles. Uh, you know, so and obviously that'll be impacted by climate and stuff. So it's pretty good. I mean, as a if you're not going to tow or haul huge amounts. That's fine. Yeah. And I, I think you guys um, towed a, a pretty good size trailer, I would say, you know, because uh, it was interesting that you guys picked the Teslas to tow because the Teslas weigh more than 
the average car, I would say. That's interesting. You picked the Teslas because you give them more publicity, and I thought you would never do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think he's, it, it, he's still driving a Model Three, I think. Right? You still got yeah. your Tesla? Yeah, yeah. yeah you it's about to get, but it's about to get back. But yeah, um, <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I mean, it was a fascinating test. But you're right, Matt. The biggest. Obviously, like how you drive it, but that's true of any car, right? That's true of a gas car as well. If you, you know, if you jump on the throttle, you, you, you know, you get put, put on. So I'm running around in a Tahoe at the moment. I'm getting like 50 miles a gallon. Um, the big, but the biggest thing, the biggest challenge is still infrastructure. And, you know, the reason where I, we ended up taking four hours longer than everybody else to complete the course is because we went to the first charge, it was 50 kilowatts. Now, we talked about this before. People say, oh, fast charger. Well, yeah, but if it's a fast charger and it's 50 kilowatts, the, the Lightning's got about a 130-ish kilowatt hour battery. So realistically, that's it, it, that's like three, four hours of charging. So I was trying to get it from sort of 25% up to 70%, still looking at a couple of hours. And then Ford's onboard system, we knew in Mojave, because we happened to be there a couple of weeks previously, that there's a, there's a faster charger than that, but Ford's system didn't bring it up. So then we, as you see in the film, we get the iPhones out and then it's like, okay, there's one up the road. We go up the road and then three of the four didn't work. So we're then faffing around. We got to take the trailer off. We put, they put it on the charger. This, this is, this is, remains the big challenge and the non Tesla infrastructure, it just isn't good enough. And, you know, we've now got EV adoption, EV sales rates this year. I was looking at some of the data is like 5% in the market. And there's a big piece of academia around, once you hit 5% of the market, that's like a real tipping point towards adoption. So we're likely to see the EV market continue to explode. There's a lot of new products coming on. But if the infrastructure doesn't catch up, it's going to be a big issue. And it's all right to say, oh, everybody's going to charge from home. But, you know, there will be needs for people to charge on the uh, to charge on the move. And 50 kilowatts isn't enough. You need 150 minimum, in my opinion. Is there? Am I missing something uh, or... Does it really need to be rectified before any more EVs are sold? I mean, it's putting the cart before the horse. Yeah, I must be missing something. Yeah, I think it's right. It's like 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 we're going to build gas cars, and then oh, we'll do the gas do the do the gas stations. We'll get Chevron to build a few gas stations in five years' time. <laughs> it, it's and 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 also there's a lot of nonsense in the politics. They come out and say. We built 300,000 chargers, but if they're level two, they're basically useless. I went to LAX the other week, went into the short stay, and they're all level two chargers. So I plugged the Tesla in, partly because then you can park at the front and not have to walk as far. Plugged it in, went and got picked up, picked up my parents, came back out. It's put like six miles on it. Yeah. You know, <laughs> short stay car park. It's like, it's took me more time to plug the damn thing in, make the app work, go and get my parents, come back again. Like you added six miles. Yeah, it's it's a nonsense. Because uh, trying to trying to get these charging stations sort of retrofitted into a lot of existing buildings, and where where we are in LA, everything is, is so much is 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 pretty old that uh, you 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 can't do it. Like you can't do it on the property unless you you figure out how to bring in a lot more power, uh, you know, or or solar or something like that. I mean. Down in Oceanside, I, I found a fast charger. It was like whatever the 150, you know, kilowatt, whatever. I mean, but it was at it was at a Walmart, you know, or a Target or something. It was at a Target, uh, and you know, maybe they're you know, and it, it seemed fairly new. The building, the whole thing, just seemed like this is a really nice brand new store. So they maybe thought ahead of this. But by the way, there was a line. There was people standing there on their phone. You know, uh, you know, just to, to, well, it was like a gas station trying to fill up, but because there wasn't enough chargers and people like hanging out and going to Target to top off their thing. Um, you're you're right, Bill. I I think I think it's a move. I think it's a strategic move. They're saying the government is saying we're going to have a harder time forcing. So many different companies and stuff to to build out more infrastructure because there isn't one group that they can attack and go build infrastructure, right? Because uh, utility companies 
never seem to have any money. So that's not going to be the solution, right? You have to go after other companies and independent companies and startups. So they, they go after the car companies to force EV, right? They're going, you got to do EV because they can control that. They can just write down a list of car companies and go, we're going after car companies. And then they sell them to us and then they want all of us to <laughs> – to scream loud enough to go, where's our infrastructure? And the government kind of hopes that we're the the pressure, you know, that's being put on whoever's going to be developing the infrastructure, various companies or whatever, solar mm-hmm. panels and this and that and, and charging stations and like all the things that need to happen. You know, they want us to push on it, which I guess is working because all we do is talk about how the infrastructure sucks, <laughs> right? I, I, <laughs> you know, I, well, I mean, they, they couldn't expect anything different by any stretch. Yeah, you know? I, I don't. Yeah, I don't know I, what the do. The are, are there charging stations at dealerships? They're starting to do that. That's one of the that's one of the things that everybody's discussing. I think there are at some dealerships. Um, but then the art. Yeah, the argument also then if you're a dealer, you've kind of got a captive audience. You know, people can go in, get a coffee. So I mean, it's actually quite a nice gig. If you think about it, you're a. You're a whatever dealer, Porsche dealer, sell them a bit of merchandise. You know, your Ford dealer, the Honda customer turns up, you put, you take them in. Uh, well, it wouldn't be Honda at the moment. They haven't got an EV, but you take me, you know my point. Yeah. Uh, then it's, but, but yeah, I, I think it's a, I think it's a huge issue. And even domestically, like I've got to spend five grand upgrading my electric so I can put a charger in at home because I bought a 1970s house and the electrics are old school. Mm. So there's a, there's, there's a big, we're trying to put a char- fast charger in at our office. And like it's mired in city permitting, and you can't do this, and you can't do this. It's just like, yeah. Listen, so we, we I try to do it in my warehouse. I was like, hey, you know, I want to. I called the electric company, and I was like, I was like, I want to put this charger in my warehouse. It's a commercial account, and they laughed. She literally laughed at me on the phone. She's like, yeah, you got to pull permits. You got to get a separate meter just for your chargers, uh, and. Uh, and there's kind of a discount program, but you got to charge it at night. I was like, but it's a business. Nobody hears at night. She's like, yeah, no, it's not a good solution. She's literally what she was telling me. She's like, charge it at home. I go, I, so I have to get all the permits and do all this shit or I don't, right? Like I just plug the car in. She's like, yeah, you could do that too. Like who am I to say what you plug into your walls? And I was like, all right, well, then there you go. And, you know, it's a warehouse that has some power, but it's, it's, it's just phase two. So we just got like a, you know, like a 50 amp circuit and hung the Ford charger on the wall and tapped it right into the breaker box. And, and that was about as much as I can get, but yeah, you know, I, you pay for in a commercial scenario. And I brought this up before you pay for all the discounts that they're giving to the residential, by the way. And everyone's like, oh, I'm going to charge at home and here's the hours. And I got an electric car. You get a discount for putting your charger in your wall at, at your, at your home. You get a discount when you charge it at night. But then when you're a business and you look at your bill, there's line items for like you got to pay for the residential discounts and you got to pay for everything else. So there's there's no free shit. That's not happening. It's just the businesses are paying for it. So, uh, Alistair, it, it's going to be a hell of a lot cheaper for you to charge it at home than charge it at at the office with the business, assuming like it was a pay charger at the business. Like if you had to go into your pocket and pay, it, you know, or if you just did the math per kilowatt, like what it, it's, it's cheaper at home than it is. At, like that's the other thing is you guys are talking about infrastructure is the, the, they're fighting businesses. They're, they're fighting businesses on making that a, a perk. They're saying, Hey, you know, we have, 20 employees, 50 employees. We love for them to carpool. We love for them to get EVs. Uh, and we want to offer them the ability to charge at work. Well, good luck. It's expensive for that business to take on that cost. Yeah. And, and, and at the moment, oh, the only way I can do it at home is to plug into the 110. And you think, well, that's like three miles an hour. So overnight, you get a little bit of charge. And it's going to take 40 hours to charge. Your yeah. Car. But then if you also, if I if I take a shower and turn the fan on, it blows the electrics. <laughs> yeah. So every time you get into shower, oh, shit. Yeah. I got like a 50 amp. And again, I haven't fully charged it. But when you plug it in and it kind of tells you the math on it, it's 
It's like 13 hours. It's a full overnight to go from like zero to 100 uh, percent charge. Oh. Now, you would never go down to zero or I don't you know, I don't know how often I would. But so, yeah, it's a it's a 10 hour charge. If I roll in with, I don't know, 40 miles on the on the battery and I want to bring it back up to 90 percent or something. Yeah, it's it's a 10 hour charge. I think our Rivian is 40 hours on a level two charger. Yeah, that's the, that's that's a lot. Um, from not from zero to a hundred again, you're probably not going to do, but yeah, it's uh, uh, all right. So moving on, let's uh, let's talk about the Rivian. What happened with you guys with the Rivian? This is kind yeah. of inter- Bill. You're going to be interested in this. This is an ergonomics thing. <laughs> it's it's a bit more. I think it's a bit more than an ergonomics thing. It's a bit of a a, a fail safe thing as well. But we so two two of the team were driving. We're just literally commuting in our our Rivian and. If you haven't heard me on the show before, we buy these cars to live with them day to day as a, you know, like, like anybody would. So two, two people were, were commuting into work. They were sharing the, they were carpooling together and we're in the carpool lane and the car basically stopped in the carpool lane on the 405. If you're not familiar with the LA 405 is probably one of the biggest highways in the uh, most busiest highways in the, in the country. Um, luckily they weren't actually going that fast at the time, but the car basically just stopped. All the systems were still on. So, and in, uh, where they ended up getting out, shutting all the doors, rebooting it, getting back in and, and managing to drive off. But it was a pretty scary incident. And as I said, in a tweet, you know, if my family had been in the car, there'd have been a you know colossal freak out or if it happened at 65 miles an hour. So we started to, to we wrote, we wrote the piece up and said, look, this happened to us. And then we engaged with conversation with Rivian about what actually went on. And we've had quite a bit of back and forth. And basically what it transpires, and Rivian, it's extraordinary like how much data they can see as well. So Rivian could not only see all the data from the truck after we gave them the VIN, probably got the VIN anyway, <laughs> but they can even play a video of what's happening on the dashboard. You know, yeah. like you have those moments with this stuff, and you're yeah, like, oh, it's a little big brotherish. It's a little we're creepy. Like, Whoa, really? And um, did you give them permission to do that? Did they have to ask for permission? Is this like inviting a vampire in your house? Like you need to get invited, or you, you know, I'm, I think I'm a little... it's one of these where you opt opt out of it. I'd have to dig into a bit more, but we weren't aware. I mean, if you'd said to me, "Can Rivian see the dashboard of the car?" I'd have said no. Right. Well, so we gave them the VIN number because basically we they they came to us. We published the article. They came to us and said we want to understand what went on. So we said, okay, so do we, and so does you know we're trying to tell the story as it is and and engage with consumers and blah blah blah. So we gave them the VIN number, but frankly they could have looked up the VIN number anyway, right? Uh, and then they started to dig into the data. And what it seems to have happened is that they we've inadvertently because the the gear stick the gear selector is on the column stalk. And basically, inadvertently knock this thing into uh, neutral. But of course, it's an EV, so you don't get engine revving. You mm-hmm. don't get so you're not seeing the rev counter go nuts and nothing happening, and you're not hearing anything. So we then so basically that nobody realised that they'd knocked it into neutral. So this went so. Ba- Sorry, somebody's beating me on my computer. Mm-hmm. It, it was. So basically the car ground to a halt and it turns out we put it into neutral. So we've now gone out and done a video of this about how easy it is to do. And apparently well, like we held the button for 200 milliseconds, which is 0.2 of a second. And then we tried it in a Tesla, for example, and Tesla has a, a fail safe mode that prevents you going into neutral when you're driving for this reason. And we're going to try it on some of our other EVs as well. So Rivian is basically saying it's human error. You knock the lever into neutral you didn't realize there was an N on the dashboard. You didn't realize and you stopped. So if you look at the article, uh, just Google Edmunds R1T, you know, uh, freeway or something, it will pop up. It, it, we we're actually updating and we we're updating it again today with more information from Rivian. So it's almost become like a blog of what happened and it's p- appeared on some of the owners forums and everything else. Cause I think it's a really important story, irrespective of whether we accidentally flick this thing up. You know, that's something that I could have done. Anybody could have done. And there's no way if the car suddenly grounds to halt that you think, oh, I've put it into neutral. Not without big flashing lights and buzzers and everything else. And 
we've got video of, of this in action, which shows that you're just not getting these warnings if you do it in the way that we did it. So it's quite, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those stories where everybody's got an opinion, but the reality is it happened and strongly believe it could happen to other people too, unless they, uh, unless they run an update. The, the gear selector, the stock, this lever coming out of the column, uh, that controls other things than gear, col- gear selection, right? It's not, it's not just drive, park, neutral. Yeah, so we originally thought that it was like turning off the, um, the cruise control. Uh, but it seems now that that looking at the data that that it wasn't the case. Yeah, so I mean, you've also got to understand that that this is not you know it's not like a gear stick in the center console. Uh, you know, it's much more accessible as you as you're on the as you're driving driving the car and on the wheel. So yeah, I mean, the reality is we just knocked it and it went into neutral. And you know, this wasn't a deliberate act. But you're right. You know, you've got you've got different buttons and different features controlling lots of different things within the car. And both Tesla and Rivian and to a certain extent Lucid have tried to simplify things and have different buttons and different controls for lots of different features, which is fine if it just adjusts a ring mirror or something like that. But, you know, this is this is getting into kind of fundamental safety stuff. Yeah, kind of interesting. I thought the car would find a way to notify you more. <laughs> Well, that's what we been saying. And I think if you t- put it into your if there's certain fail, there are certain things within the car that will give you more notification. But what happened to us, there wasn't enough to alert anybody that they'd gone into that got into neutral. And that this has happened. Of course, you don't have the telltale signs that you would in a gas car. Right. I mean, you can say like it's a little nuance, it's an unusual situation, but it's you know, it's a scary it was a scary moment. And you know, that's why we're here, right? I don't think this is like you know, Rivian is a startup company. They're working their way through all these like little gremlins and systems and everything else. And the great thing about over the air updates is that you can put these things right. And I kind of feel like it's our job. And the reason we buy these cars and run them as we do is to unearth this stuff. Because if if we don't and you don't have like independent testing, then, you know, where's the feedback loop? Well, look, I, I, I agree with that completely. If 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 there's a way to sort of accidentally pop it into neutral and you don't really know what's going on. You just feel like the thing is dying down. I, I kind of feel like, yes, putting this out there would be if we were driving a Rivian and it all of a sudden lost power, I guess my first thing would be, would be, is it in drive? You know, now that we know that's potentially a, a thing, right? I wouldn't, yeah, I, I agree with you guys. I think, I would have been concerned that the thing broke, like the vehicle stopped working, it ran out of power, maybe the battery's dead, who knows what. I wouldn't have thought I popped it into neutral accidentally. But eh, I guess you know, it's kind of an interesting thing. Um, not having the engine sound, I think, is, uh, is the thing that would, would throw us off. You know, you pop it into neutral, you're doing 40 miles an hour down the road, <laughs> you accidentally pop it into neutral, you're going to hear that thing spin up pretty quickly, bounce off the rev limiter. So engine sounds or if, a big thing. Or if you're in the law, man, you, you blow it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, and the right. other thing is there's no, there's no start and stop button. So actually then you get into how do I turn this thing off and how do I, how do, I do control out delete? Yes, yeah. Because you don't have a, a starter button because it's one of these things where you just get in and drive away, and that's great. Apart from a situation like this, where what they wanted to do was basically stop, just you know, turn the car off, turn it back on again. You, you, you know, it's interesting because this has actually come up as someone who uh, drives quite a few press cars, like you do as well. I've been in a number of cars where, like, the infotainment system didn't work, or the, the backup camera, and uh, and I'm always thinking about like, how do I reboot the car? And I'm always, I know you guys have done this, right? It's like you turn the car off, you got to open the door, it shuts down the infotainment system, but is it still sort of like on? Is it, you know? And it's like, so if you got back into the car quickly, when does it really go off? So the things I always kind of look for is. Is there a reboot, right? Is there a way to like hold down the power button or, or something on the infotainment system and do it? It was one of the first things that I actually looked up in the manual when I got the Ford Lightning. I looked at this giant screen up there. It's all electric. And my first thought was, at some point, this computer that I'm driving is going to need to be rebooted. And and I'm going to be jammed in a situation 
And uh, and in this particular instance, the steering wheel controls, I think that's the volume controls are on the left thumb and the um, uh, like channel selector, you know, for the radio are on the right thumb. And if you hit the the left, which is the outermost volume on your left hand, and the channel selector on the right, which is the rightmost volume, if you hold down both of those buttons on your steering wheel at the same time, it reboots your infotainment system, right? So I just want to – that was one of the – by the way, holding the power button down like most electronics does not do it. You have to do the steering wheel controls to do it. So finding out how to reboot the system is going to be something I think we're going to want to know more about as these cars become more and more sophisticated with their electronics. Um, all right, enough Rivian, enough electric, enough towing. You sent uh, somebody out to drive the Z06. Now, you've been teasing the Z06 that you were going to be driving it, the Corvette Z06. We're all super interested. Uh, somehow you wussed out. You decided not to go. You thought the car was too fast and powerful for you. Uh, so you yeah. sent somebody else. That's what happened. Is that time. what happened? <laughs> hey, before we get off the subject, have you run the, the towing test with the Rivian? It, I, I'd like to see the Rivian versus the Lightning. Yeah, that's something that we're looking at doing. We're also looking at doing more tow tests with different things to understand like some of this impact to try and get try and get an answer for what Matt was saying was like, how far will I go? How far will it tow? Because we almost want to be able to say like, if you're towing your kids cross country with like their college gear and you hire a U-Haul, you'll go this far. If you're towing your race car on the back of a transporter and at 55 miles an hour, you'll go this far. So yeah, we're looking at that. And obviously, we now, our, our Lightning actually arrived last week. So we now own a Lightning. The tow test one was one we borrowed, but we own a Lightning. We own a Rivian. So stand by on that. Uh, and we got a couple, bit of fun stuff at the weekend that we're shooting, which I can't tell you about, but I will next time I come on. Yeah. That's a bit of a okay. laugh. Okay. And look, and your your article about that made a good point, though. When you're you're driving your Silverado or your, you know, your, your diesel Ram, when you add a bunch of weight in a trailer, the range goes down on that truck. If it's 300 miles per tank, it drops down to, I don't know, 250. But you can go and fill it up and it takes just a couple of minutes, which is not really the point of the article. We're not talking about how long does it take to to fuel up your truck. We're talking about how far do you go on a you know, full tank versus a full battattery. Infrastructure yeah, I mean, is another the problem, thing. The problem is it's both, right, in the real world. And and the the other thing is you start off with either the gas cars or the diesel, you start off with more energy. Like you just have more energy in the fuel tank than you do in the battery. Mm -hmm. So the electric can be more efficient than the gas or the diesel, but you've just got more energy on board to start with. So yeah. you can go further. Um, I mean, we kind of came to the conclusion that if you're towing all the time by the diesel, but yeah. if you're using it for mixed use, and particularly if you live in an urban area, then actually the hybrid, the hybrid doesn't do much when you're towing, but overall as a truck for, you know, doing loads of stuff with and, and towing occasionally, a hybrid makes a, makes, makes a ton of sense. But yeah, that, I mean, that's, but it is, it comes about the infrastructure, Matt, you know, it's like, yeah. A, if the diesel will go 600 miles or 500 miles or whatever it is, because it's got a massive tank of diesel, that's great. And if you do need to fill it up, you've got loads of confidence and security and millions of fuel stations, and it takes two minutes. Yeah. But I, I, I agree with Bill. I think, you know, Lightning versus Hummer versus Rivian kind of tow test, because at least the infrastructure is kind of equal for yeah. for those three vehicles, right? Like a shitty charging situation is a shitty charging situation. I th what maybe what you'll find that we don't know is I don't know where you plug in all of the vehicles if they're all sort of located in that kind of front fender area. Uh, uh but would you have to unhitch the trailer in under all the scenarios or well or it that that depends more on the charging location so yeah. if you get a charger in like a big open car park no but a lot of charges if they're a racket like the one we found in mojave was kind of under a canopy beside a hotel so you know you just didn't have the real estate so again that just that's almost potluck really yeah right 
Okay. Yeah, but I'd be curious to see how those all kind of compare with each other and what, what does it do. Um, you know, not just the total range, but, you know, do you lose half the battery on all three vehicles or does one end up being a little smarter than the other? Does do you lose 30%? Yeah, you're, or? you're right. There's a lot of clever tech goes into managing towing with these things. Like yeah. in the Ford, it turns off one pedal driving. So you can't, you know, you need to drive it more like a conventional truck and that's a safety thing. So, you know, there's a lot, yeah, how, which car manages its energy better when you've got a, a massive weight on the back. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's a lot goes into it. Obviously, the, the Rivian's a different construction to the Ford. The Ford's a ladder frame, you know, still a ladder frame chassis. So there's, there's, a, there's a whole different bunch of stuff that runs into this as well. Uh, okay, by the way, that one pedal driving thing, I... I'm I'm not I'm not a f- fan of it. Maybe if you're rock climbing and doing something, but just around town, I I got into an Uber and it was like a Model Three, and they had the one pedal thing on. What the most uncomfortable ride I've ever been? It was just constant back and forth. And five, I'm flopping around the back seat with this one pedal thing. It's like I was like, you can let the car coast. Of like what? You know, I, you know you know what I'm saying? So it's like. You let your foot off the throttle and it coasts a little bit and it makes it comfortable for the people driving. But when you do the one pedal, as soon as you let your foot off, it starts hitting the brake and it's on and off and on and off. And maybe that's just me, but I think it's uncomfortable. I think that's probably the drive though. Matt. That, that's that's <laughs> no different to him jumping off the throttle and jumping on the brakes, yeah. which also yeah. happened to me in an Uber in a camera the other day. So. <laughs> yeah, that happens in an Uber for, regardless of what you drive. Um, all right. So what's the... Uh, you sent someone out to drive this the Z06. Um, a lot of people are saying it's you know it's fantastic. People are joking that uh, you know this is the best Ferrari I've driven since the 458, uh, and then of course it's a Corvette. So ha ha. But uh, um, but yeah, I don't know. It's just I, I think we could just kind of had high hopes for this this American supercar that has a fantastic sound and naturally aspirated, just kind of everything as enthusiasts that we love seem to be on the menu. Yeah. And I think I spoke to Kurt yesterday who Kurt Nibu went, went out and drove it. And we have a little video on our, our YouTube channel now. Yeah. He loved it. it. It sounds, it sounds sensational. It does sound like a Ferrari. Um, he feels like it's a really big jump over the standard car, which is already great. And, you know, you're really starting to exploit what the mid engine configuration offers you. And, you know, there's also quite a jump from the Z06 to the Z07. Z07 gives you carbon fiber wheels, which I think off the top of my head would save you something crazy like 40 pounds of unsprung mass. So you've got a lot of, you know, that brings the, all, the, all the different goodies. You can introduce carbon brakes and everything else. So it's kind of like the way Kurt described it, it was basically like a jump from a 911 Carrera to a, to a GT3. It's that much of a leap. And, you know, it's, Another little analogy that I really enjoyed, I can't remember, I think I saw this on Twitter, but I'm going to steal it anyway. Somebody said it's like the difference between, you know, like an EV going this fast and one of these going this fast is like the difference between a kind of, you know, an Apple Watch and a, you know, and a, and a kind of Panerai or something that, you know, they both sort of achieve, the, the Apple Watch achieves it better, it achieves it easier, but there's something wonderful about the kind of mechanical sound and the the whole, you know, the the the, the artistry of, of the engine and, and what have you. So, yeah, I, as I say, I was gutted not to be able to make the trip. Uh, we'll be getting one in the office, I'm sure. But it does look very cool. I was kind of working out, could we swap our V8 for <laughs> one of those? But they're a, they're a ton of money. By the time you, yes, they are cheap compared to a McLaren or a Ferrari or something like that. But by the time you put all the packages on and everything else, it's, it's, it's and then if there's a dealer markup, it gets, it gets super pricey. But the, I mean, apart from, it's something, there's that car, I'm driving the, Hurricane uh, Technica, the Lamborghini tomorrow, which uh, up in Palm Springs on a circuit. And that's like the last V10 naturally aspirated Lamborghini. Yeah. And then Audi's just doing a run out model of the R8, which uh, has the naturally aspirated engine. And this is kind of like the last throw. And it's fascinating that GM spent all this money and all this effort to to do this flat plane crank and everything else. It's great. I mean, it's it's so cool. And it sounds incredible. I, I mean, they they could get ten years out of it, right, or something like that. I'm not sure when we're when are we getting forced to pull the plug on this EV thing. I'm, I'm sure they're gonna they're already working on the hybrid, right? I don't know if they're doing the full EV, but we've already seen testing or something on on a hybrid Corvette. And 
I don't know if it's just meant to be different or if it's supposed to sort of one up the the Z06, but there is something special about just having that that engine and that sound and rear wheel drive and American power plant. And I know you're saying it's it's expensive, you know, after markups and packages and stuff, but what what does this come in at? Like around a hundred grand base price? You can't think, buy it for a hundred grand, but let's say it it, it stickers. Base is about a hundred and six, and it goes up from there. Um, but but you're right. It's in, you make an interesting point as well. It's what something that we were discussing in Detroit uh, where we went to the the Mustang was launched, and we did a little film of the sound of the engine, the V eight, mm-hmm. and. On the first twelve hours in TikTok, it got over on TikTok. It got over a million views, and I think cumulative, it's got like three million views. And all it is is like the sound of the engine revving, and it's just a shot of the exhaust. Yeah, there is still so much interest in this, and I mean, you know, you can talk this, Bill, but Dodge has pulled the Charger and Challenger. You know that that's got very little life left. Yeah, they're doing that sooner Cam- rather than Camaro. Later. Doesn't look like there's going to be another generation of a gas-powered Camaro. So suddenly you're looking at the Mustang and the Mustang is kind of, it's saying it's a new generation. There's a lot of carryover from the old one, but it's, it's, you know, suddenly the Mustang's got the, got the market to itself potentially. And we're only in 2022. We've probably got at least another 15 years to go before there's like, you know, even if that happens, then there's legislation. So you just can't sell these anymore. So it feels to me like there's a big opportunity there and everybody's getting out of this market and saying, Oh no, we got to get down this road. But I don't know. I kind of look at it and think of Chevy and you know Stellantis, Dodge gone too early. I, I, it's it's a crapshoot, that's for sure. Yeah, but you know, like you're saying, like uh, with Corvette, to have gas engine options and hybrid or EV options, right? Um, uh, Maserati's just announced doing that with the Gran Turismo, right? They're like, oh, we're you know, you want the turbo V6? Cool. You want the EV? We'll have that too. You know, um, and and yeah, everyone's like, "Oh, we were expecting a, a, a an electric Mustang and a, a, a you know hybrid Mustang." I was like, "Well, we have the Maki. That's they already called it the Mustang. We've already got that." I I know we're that's not what they meant, but that was kind of the brand strategy behind the Mustang. And they're like, "Well, what's the life cycle of a platform for a car? About eight years, maybe maybe ten years if you're if you're Dodge." Challenger and Dodge and Charger. Maybe it's well, thirty. Maybe it's I, I, twenty-two I years. There was a, there was a new three hundred C in Detroit, and I was like, "Is that thing still going?" Yeah, that's I what I thought too. Right. <laughs> yeah. I remember driving that in the UK when it was cool and retro Americana, and I think that was like it was that early two thousands. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, so Ford saying, "Oh, we're going to have this new Mustang. We're going to have gas engine options for it. We're going to have the V eight and the EcoBoost." And uh, we're like, oh well, sure. That's a that's eight more years, probably at least eight more years, if not close to double that. Like you're saying, by time legislation everything happens. But that my my question is, do the is there a drop dead date for these car companies taking the lack of infrastructure into account? You know, I mean, yeah, when it, it doesn't get to a certain point, do you halt? your your strategy over the pet i mean just it's a tough time you know why i I see what you're saying it's like why why go all electric when infrastructure isn't even close to being able to support it the the car companies i think are hesitating they're they're they don't want to start building ford and chevrolet charging stations all around the country and and for whatever reason, we're we're getting these like startup companies or whatever they are, you know, EV Go or Charge America. It's like, where's Chevron? Where's Shell? Where's mm-hmm. you know, where are these guys on on doing this, right? Because I, I get they're in the oil business, but you got to look at this other aspect of business that they've figured out, and that's mm-hmm. it's, it's putting these gas station locations everywhere. It's it, part of the problem is that a lot of the gas stations are franchised. You know, it's not like Shell owns them, 
So it's not like Shell can walk in and say, okay, every Shell station, I mean, it's happening, right? There's a few near me that are starting to get fast chargers installed. But I don't think it's as simple as them walking in and uh, because, you know, somebody's got to write a check and it's. Right. But where's the incentive? Where's the program? Yeah, where's yeah. Shell? Where's Shell's big press release going? We have chargers. We have electricians. We have everything to retrofit most or or 50 percent or 20 percent of the Shell stations across America. If you, the franchisee, would choose to it to do it, give us a call and we have a turnkey package. We have people that come to you. We can install, we can do this and it'll increase your revenue. This is what it means for you. It's like, and where's all the like shell or Chevron or 76 sort of branded programs, you know, that's the answer I thought. Crickets, crickets, crickets. You've got a captive audience to go and buy Monster Energy drinks while you while it's charging because well, you've got already got the. That's the, right. Otherwise, I've got uh, a bunch of guys standing in, you know, like you said, like a carport with a bunch of charging stations with guys sitting there on the phones and you know, or you know, well, what are they doing? What's what's the point? And it it feels. The whole process kind of feels like a pain in the ass. Like now I got to sit in my car or. or I can see a company like Amazon doing it. Yeah. Well, I. Yes. That's what I'm saying is, is, is. Purchase their products while you're charging. Well, they're also building a, but yeah, building a whole infrastructure of electric, um, electric vans, but like. You're right. I mean, who's going to buy those sausages? You know, the ones that like sit there and just turn over. <laughs> that's, that's right. They've been there all day. You got to get them in the morning. That's the trick. I mean, I, you know. I, I mean a, a program where maybe maybe the, the gas companies are going, well, listen, we have a couple of options. You can plug in and get, you know, phase two chargers or we can offer uh, discount programs or financing for solar panels to put on top of your 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 gas station. Right. Because almost all of them have the fuel pumps with the roof above it. Like how are we, you know, does it make sense to put some solar power up there and, and offset some of the costs on the long term, and, you know, just things like that. Like, where's that program? They got to be thinking about it, right? Like they got to, these big gas companies got to be thinking about it. Right. And the franchisee must be going, Hey man, um, I, you know, I know I'm still going to be selling gas, but if Gavin Newsom says, like, you know, you can't buy a new gas engine car after 2035, uh, hey, Chevron, what are you going to do for me as a franchisee? Like, what are you going to do to help me stay in business? Like, it, am I going to have to just come to terms with making, I don't know, 25% less money for the rest of my life and have that dwindle down? Like, what's the future here? <laughs> yeah. Right? Anyway. Um, all right. So it what was else? A great irony. It was a great irony of the Detroit Auto Show, which generally was pretty quiet and a little bit, a little bit sad, really, uh, and caught and massively compromised by the president arriving. But like, it was all about you know EV, blah blah blah. But the big star of the show was the Mustang. It was the big star of the show. They, and then, and then the other, the other like big reveal was a six point two liter Tahoe, like sports edition of a Tahoe. Yeah. <laughs> Oof. I, I'm just saying the people are speaking, right? I think we're people are kind of speaking and yeah, saying, Michigan. saying, "Listen, we're, we're you know we're we're getting there. We're not we're not totally down with the EV, but we're getting there, you know." But I don't know. We'll see. Um, all right, we're gonna have to wrap things up. We've got another show coming in in a bit. But uh, uh, Alistair Edmonds dot com. What else you guys got on the docket? What else should we be looking for? No, nah, there's a huge there's a huge amount of stuff actually. We've got a really just a really busy time. We've got people all over the world. We're driving the Eurus, um what's the Eurus S, what's the fast one? We're driving that next yeah. week. We've got Civic Type R's not too far away. Uh, you know, also in the real world, we've got, you know, CRVs coming up and there's just a lot, you know, there's a lot going on. We have a team of forty three people now and like we always seem to be everybody seems to be flat out. So um yeah, check out edmunds.com slash news uh, for all the latest. Well, as always, thank you for what you're doing for the consumer. We no, no, thank you. Thank you. We it's appreciate always- it. Come on. Uh, thanks, guys. Again, it's edmunds.com. You want to check them out. Uh, yeah, we're going to wrap things up. Until next time, keep the air in the spare and the bag in the wheel. For the latest updates and call-in times, follow the show on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at CarCast Show. If you'd like to write in, fill out the form on carcastshow.com. 
And don't forget to give us a nice rating on iTunes. CarCast is a Corolla digital production and is produced by Chris Loxamana. For more information, visit CarCastShow.com. Do you own? Do you rent your home? Sure you do. And it can be hard work. You know what's easy? Bundling your policies with GEICO. GEICO makes it easy to bundle your homeowners or renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because you have so much to do already around your home. Why not make it easy? Go to GEICO.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save. It's GEICO easy. Visit GEICO.com today. That's GEICO.com. All this month, celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month with Pluto TV. Watch movies with the biggest stars like Eugenio Derbez in No Eres Tu, Soy Yo and Luis Gerardo Mendez in Camino a Marte. Plus, Pluto TV has thousands more movies and TV shows and over 45 channels in Spanish, all for free. So download the Pluto TV app on all your favorite devices and start streaming today. Pluto TV, drop in, watch free.